10 to B, Article and C, Article 27, Article 73, 1A, Article 73, 2B, 75, 1C, Article 129, as well as Article 147, 1, as read together with Article 131, 2C, and B. And basically, what we are saying is that the Deputy President in the last two years has been in various places within the Republic of Kenya and has been publicizing a, a notion that Kenya is a company that is owned by shareholders and only those who have shares in the company called Kenya, according to him, will benefit in terms of development and service delivery from the Republic. And it is our contention that Kenya is not a company. Kenya is a republic that is, uh, that is supposed to serve all Kenyans. And the particular articles of the Constitution that we have cited because of time also speak to the functions of the Deputy President being able to promote national unity and the country citizens of Kenya being able to receive services and development from the government, including appointments, without discrimination. So that is in, in short. Let's, let's, let's quickly go through uh, some of those provisions. If you could be shown the preamble to our constitution, what does the third paragraph say? Miss, Mr. Speaker, Honorable Senators, the preamble to our constitution, and I read the third paragraph, proud of our ethnic, cultural, and religious diversity. Underline ethnic, cultural, and religious di diversity. And determined to live in peace and unity as one indivisible sovereign nation. One indivisible sovereign nation. We'll, we'll come to the evidence you have adduced to support this shortly, but are the utterances you complain about consistent with that constitutional provision? Definitely not at all. Let's go quickly to Article 10. What does it say? Article 10.1. The national values and principles of governance in this article bind all state organs, state officers, public officers, and all persons whenever any of them A, applies or interprets this constitution, B, enacts, applies or interprets any law, or C, makes or implements public policy decisions. But, uh, honorable member, someone would say these are just utterances and we surely can't remove a deputy president from office because he has a loose tongue or something like that. What is the problem with these utterances in the context of our history as the Republic of Kenya? Number one, the constitutional context is that uh, they bind all state officers and the deputy president is a state officer. So there are no two ways. You cannot choose the laws to obey and which not to obey. But number two, we have also had an history in our country. All of us would remember that we had clashes in Likoni in 1992 where populations were displaced. We had problems in Molo every other cycle of election, election cycle, 1992-1997. Even most recently, the country almost torn apart during the post-election violence of 2007 and 2008. There are examples within the region. Rwanda, Burundi is still struggling. As we speak today, Congo is fighting. Across the globe, Yugoslavia, there has been problems, Bosnia, all these countries. And they all began from utterances of this nature. So is it your testimony, therefore, that utterances of the type we're about to see are a threat to the very existence of Kenya as a republic? Indeed, that is my testimony. Is our lived history consistent with the submission that those are not utterances that should emanate from the deputy president of the republic? Not just the deputy president of the republic, but not from any citizen of the republic. But Honorable Motuse, have you placed any evidence? You say the deputy president has been doing this for two years. Have you placed any material to prove this allegation? Yes. We have placed videos, evidence in the form of videos that have been recorded in meetings where the Deputy President has been attending, being video one, video two, video three, video four, video eight, and video 11, which contain utterances of the Deputy President in that regard. Mr. Speaker, I request we 
play video number one from the National Assembly set of videos. Sisi lasema tumiangalia nyinyi. Hii serikali ni kampuni na ni ya shares. Si ndio? Ni ya shares. Kuna wenye kampuni wale wako na shares mingi, kuna wale wako na chache, kuna wale hawana. Sasa nyinyi muli university kwa hii kampuni ya William Ruto na Regati Gashagua. Sasa lazima mvune yule ambaye alipanda atafanya nini? Simulipanda? Simuliamuka mapema? Muka sema mutaki kusikia mambo ya ile system na nini? Muka invest, muka panda, muka palilia, muka weka mbolea, muka mwagilia maji, wakati ya kufuna ndiyo huu. Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Na hiyo ya gina wana nikachifu ati mimi nasema, ati wale wali panda wafune kwanza. Hiko makosa? Hiko makosa? Ata hao watafuna lakini wangoje. Si wale wali panda ni wafune kwanza? Wakishavu na wavune, 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 ile tabaki kidogo, wale wakupanda, waingie, watavute huko, nini, ile tapatikana, wachukue, wakuende. Siyuko na muna hiyo? Na itakuwa na muna hiyo. Diyo watu wakipiga kura waelewe hii kura di kusema nini? Hii kura hiko na maana. Nini ya muwezi pika kelele huko, mupike kelele, muna sema wili ya mubuto ni bure, hawezi, muna ita ya majina, alafu wakipata, akikawa, muna pika laini ya tibuko pale mbele. Ati munataka mupite wale walisema anafaa ati mkuwe pale mbele inaweza kana. Mimi kazi yangu pale kwa ikulu ni hiyo. Ni kupanga hiyo laini. Hapo, ni kazi mimi napanga hapo. Mimi naangalia kwa laini, ni kiona we ulipanda, na putawe nyuma, na peleka we mbele. Because, because of the constraint of time, Honorable Mutuse, what did these utterances mean and what were they understood by any fair-minded Kenyan to mean? The ordinary meaning is that there are Kenyans who are supposed to benefit from the Kenyan government and there are other Kenyans who are not supposed to benefit from the Kenyan government. And His Excellency the Deputy President will make sure only those who voted for the present government benefit from the government. And those who did not vote for the government will not get any benefits because they are not shareholders. Are those utterances consistent with the national value of human dignity in Article 10 b Not at all. Are they consistent with the value of national unity in Article 10 a Not at all. Are they consistent with social justice in Article 10 2 b Not at all. What about inclusiveness? Indeed, they are divisive. What about equality? Not at all. What about non-discrimination? They are very discriminative. What about protection of the marginalized? They do not protect the marginalized, they marginalize them further. We could go on and on, sir. Are those utterances consistent with any of the articles you claim in ground one have been violated? Not at all. Let's play video number two, honorable speaker. President Rigadi Gashagwa again brought up the political shareholding narrative, saying the Kenya Kwanzaa administration will prioritize Kenyans who voted for it in the distribution of government employment slots and development projects. Well, Gashagwa spoke in Nandi County, where he led other government officials in a church service and thereafter a fundraiser at Kurgung Boys High School. Ayub Abdikadir reports. Mosop constituency in Nandi County offered Gashagwa a platform to amplify his narrative about the government being a shareholding entity that apparently belongs to those who voted for it, calling on the people of Nandi County to remain patient as the state works on development projects and employment opportunities that would prioritize Kenya Kwanza supporters. Raisa Kopale, Niko Abo. 
huyu Felix hako hapo rais mnamjua mimi mnanijua msimamo yangu ya kwamba watoto wakiwa wengi kuna wale kwanza ya kuangaliwa si mnajua sasa huyu Felix hako pale ndio mwenye kuunganisha mawaya mambo yetu tumepanga as remarks similar to the last time he sparked public debate by hinting at preferential treatment for Kenyans who voted for the government mambo iko sawa chakula iko jikoni karibu kuiva watoto ni wengi chakula ni kidogo iko watoto ya nyumbani iko wa jirani iko namna hiyo na nyinyi mtulie chakula ikiiva sisi ndio kupakua na watoto tunawajua kwa sura na kwa msimamo hatuwezi kuwa confused kuna mtu ajui watoto yake the deputy president who led other kenya kwanza leaders for a church service and thereafter a fundraiser at Kurugung Boys High School also outlined measure let's play that in the interest of time Mr Speaker I want to play all of them then I'll put the questions let's hear video number 3 I believe Shago says he has no apologies to make over his shareholders narratives saying those who voted in the Kenya Kwanza government should we big from the government? Well, Gashagwa, who was speaking in Nandi County, where he led a fundraiser towards the construction of the ACK Plaza in Kapsabet Town, also dismissed claims that there are differences between himself and President William Ruto. Martin Munene has the details. Deputy President Aragade Gashagua was in President William Ruto's Rift Valley backyard on Sunday, where he presided over fundraiser in aid of Kapsabet ACK Church. And here, the DP made it clear that he was not backing down on his shareholders' gospel that has left a bad taste in many people's mouths. I am unapologetic to demand and to insist that those who believed in William Ruto and supported him to a man have every right to benefit immensely from his government. I have no apology. Let's play video number four, eight, and eleven in that sequence. Mr. a government is like a company. There is shareholding. Kunawale who have invested a lot of shares. Kuna wale wameweka kidogo. Kuna wale wamekataa. Lakini wote ni wa Kenya. So ndio tukasema kama wewe umeenda kupanda mahindi. Ama wacha nipeane example ya ngombe kwa sababu niko kajiano. Wewe uko na ngombe yako ya maziwa. Hiyo ngombe imezaliwa ikiwa njau, umeichunga vizuri, umepatia majani umenulia dairy mill umepatia chumvi umepeleka kwa malisho umepatia maji imezaa imeanza kukamuliwa wewe unatakiwa kwanza ukue mtu ya kwanza kukamua hiyo ngombe na kukunywa maziwa serikali a government is like a company there is shareholding kuna wale who have invested a lot of shares kuna wale wameweka kidogo kuna wale wamekataa lakini wote ni wa Kenya. So ndio tukasema kama wewe umeenda kupanda mahindi. Ama wacha nipeane example ya ngombe kwa sababu niko kajiano. Wewe uko na ngombe yako ya maziwa. Hiyo ngombe imezaliwa ikiwa njau. We can go to the next because we see an element of repetition. Let's go to the next video. wakiongozwa na kemani chomwa wako pale mbunge wagawe pesa kwa kila mtu Kenya na hivyo ndivyo inaendelea yes video na number 11 kwa watu ya kukusaidia utatafuta the good people of Homa Bay that I am going to work with your leaders, the ones you have elected, 
so that we can develop our country together. Competition is over. Si tumemaliza mambo ya mashindano. Si tumemaliza mambo ya mashindano. Si ile kazi imebaki ni sisi kuwafanyia kazi sasa. Si ni kweli? Muko tayari kufanya kazi na mimi. Munasema nifanye kazi na viongozi wenu. Wale mlio wachagua. Mimi na wahakikishia nitafanya kazi na wao ndio tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Homa Bay, tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Kenya ndio tuweze kupeleka taifa letu mbele. Tuondoe umaskini, tupange ajira ya hawa vijana, tupunguze gharama ya chakula na tupange mambo ya maendeleo ya Kenya, tutengeneze nchi ambayo kila mkenya anajivunia kuwa mkenya. So Mona Mutusa, you know we could play these videos on and on. Unfortunately, time is not with us. But please confirm that you have presented before Senate utterances made by the Deputy President on this theme in Kitui. Is that correct? It, that is correct. In Nandi, is that correct? That is correct. In Kericho, is that correct? That is correct. In Kajiando? That is correct. Please confirm it is in public domain. These utterances have been made in very many other places. These were just illustrations. Indeed, I suspect it, they have been made even in the counties represented by the senator seated here. Have these been isolated aberrations or has it been a consistent campaign and mantra by the deputy president across the republic? It has been consistent and as the deputy president says, unapologetic. But you also played for us a video where the president is speaking. How does it compare with the utterances and the campaign by his deputy? The president is preaching national unity. And I believe that is a function assigned to the president under Article 131 of the Constitution to be a symbol of national unity. And the deputy president is also required to deputize the president in performance of his functions. And therefore, it will be expected that the deputy president will take cue. Instead, the deputy president is contradicting the president. We have seen these events covered by a major television station, right? Indeed. Does that television, to the best of your knowledge, have national or is it local coverage? National and, sometime, and some of them regional coverage. Should the deputy president of the republic have the wisdom to know his utterances will be conveyed to the country and the world? Indeed, yes. We saw him talking about children that belong to the family, and although we don't use the language these days, some illegitimate children. Who yes. was he calling children from outside the home or the illegitimate ones? Looking in totality for more his videos, he must have made those who voted for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children, and those who did not vote for Kenya Kwanza as the legitimate children. We have seen him saying he has no apologies to make, notwithstanding that these utterances, to quote the media, who are leaving a bad taste in the mouths of many people. Is that correct or incorrect? Yes, he is very loudly clear that he has no apologies to make for calling, for referring to Kenya for saying Kenya is a company belonging to shareholders for the benefit of the shareholders. That defiance and the stance that he has no apology to make, does it depict the deportment of a man or a woman who should be the deputy president of the Republic of Kenya? Not at all. But you, uh, you heard his counsel say that there must be some extraordinary wrongdoing before we can impeach for mere utterances or for the things you have alleged. To the best of your knowledge, sir, how many vice presidents or deputy presidents has Kenya had since 1963? In your estimate, how many? Eleven. Eleven. Eleven or thereabout? Let, let's say a dozen, twelve, right? Yes. Do we have in our history since 1963 experience of a deputy president who traverses the country's preaching ethnic exclusion 
I don't remember any. The only incident I remember, two incidences, uh. when Jaramogi differed with Kenyatta and he did the moral thing, resigned uh. from government. I also remember an incident, I think it was Vice President Morumbi, who also differed with the then president and did the honorable thing and resigned from government. Those were the first two vice presidents, Daniel Arap Moy was at that. Do you know of any incident where Daniel Arap Moy was moving around this country as vice president, Did what? committing this type of wrongdoing? No, not at all. How about Moy Kibaki? In fact, even when he was demoted, he continued working in cabinet. How about Josephat Karanja? Not at all. How about George Saitoti? Even when he was, uh, he was sacked, he continued being loyal to the government of the day. How about Musalim Devadi? In his short stint, nothing is hard about him undermining his boss. How about the country? Modi Awari? Not at all. Kalonzo Musioka? Not at all. So when we are told there is nothing extraordinary about this wrongdoing, is that consistent with the lived reality of Kenya? There is everything extraordinary. When a country of 46 tribes, someone advocates for the servicing of less than two of their, those communities, where will the 44 go? Given the politics of 41 against one in 2007 and the post-election violence, would this allegation be extraordinary wrongdoing? It is an extraordinary wrongdoing. In fact, the post-election violence that resulted from that particular kind of campaign was in itself extremely dangerous to our social fabric and extremely dangerous to our economy. Given the experience of the Molo and Likoni clashes in the 90s, would this be extraordinary wrongdoing coming from the second senior Mu state officer? Indeed, and also when it is remembered that he was a district officer in Molo when those clashes were happening. Given what is going on right now as we speak in Tana River, who would conduct like this emanating from none other than the deputy of the president be extraordinary misconduct? I have seen in news that there are families that are displaced, people have lost property, and if that is not extraordinary, then I do not know what extraordinary means. Given, sir, and I will summarize this, what this type of campaign achieved in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Sudan, in South Sudan, in former Yugoslavia, in Nigeria, the Biafra War, and we could count and count until the cows go home. Can anyone be heard in good conscience to say that this is not extraordinary misconduct? Indeed, that, that this is ex, ex, very extraordinary, requiring impeachment. Please confirm, because we are pressed for time, that the evidence you're relying on on this ground applies equally to allegation number five of your motion. Just a minute to confirm. What is your complaint in allegation number five? Allegation number five, Mr. Speaker, will be at page 16 to 17 of volume two. Allegation number five, just a minute. Mr. Speaker, honorable members, our allegation number five relates to gross violation of article three one of the Constitution and Article 148.5a of the Constitution, which particularly, specifically, is in relation to the breach of the oath of office and allegiance. Does the oath of office require the Deputy President to promote national unity or the shareholder politics? The oath of office demands of the Deputy President to promote national unity. And what is your complaint in ground number six, sir? In ground number six, that again is on page 16 to 17, Mr. Speaker. Ground number six 
is about serious reasons to believe that the Deputy President has committed a crime under national law pursuant to Article 151B and 2 of the Constitution. And what is the specific complaint? The specific complaint is that uh, there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under Section 13.1a and 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act. Can you please read for us those sections of the law? Section 13 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act provides that it is an offense. Honorable Speaker, that, that section will be in Volume 7 of the Assembly's documents. That it is, it is an offense for any person to use threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behavior where the person intends to stir up feelings of ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. The section also makes it an offense to use words or engage in such behavior when having regard to all the circumstances, ethnic hatred is likely to be stirred up. Is ethnic hatred likely to be stirred up by this campaign of shareholding? Obviously. Is it likely to stir up ethnic contempt? Obviously. What does Section 62 say? Section 62 of the National Cohesion and Integration Act states that a person commits an offense when the person makes statements that are intended or are likely to stir up feelings of ethnic, ethnic contempt, hatred, hostility, violence, or discrimination. Are the utterances by the Deputy President likely to trigger any of those things? Yes, indeed. As a matter of fact, Honorable Mutuse, that law you just read, National Cohesion and Integration, was indeed the law Parliament enacted to ensure we never go back to where our country was in 2007, 2008, in because fact, of utterances like this. It was pursuant to the post-election violence, and the country resolved that we needed a law as a result. And therefore, it is a law that is supposed to ensure that we in office live to promote national unity and not the opposite. Given that history and why that law exists, sir, we repeat the question. Has the deputy president committed ordinary or extraordinary wrongdoing? He has, under Article 150 of the Constitution, in relation to this ground, there are serious reasons to believe that he has committed wrongs against the National Cohesion and Integration Act, uh, and if extraordinary in nature. And, 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 and if you allow me, these are not my words. Uh -huh. I have been accused of urging the National Assembly to believe me. These are not my words, they are words of the Constitution, under Article 150. Thank you. I want us, Mr. Speaker, we are urging the Senate, if you consider the evidence so far adduced, then that evidence applies to ground one, five, and six. So we are prosecuting them together to save on time. Let's go to allegation number seven, sir. Mr. Speaker, that allegation runs from pages 17 to 31. It was the one you were told runs from falsehoods, culminating in the embarrassing and other things. Let's see whether it is actually falsehoods embarrassing and the other adjectives that we were told that I would urge members to work with me by holding volume 2A, volume 2A of the assembly's documents together with our volume 6. 6 I only mention it briefly. Please confirm, sir, at page two of volume six, who as between you and the deputy president as passions were cast, that you are referring to irrelevant material about the estate of the lady Ritu Gajegua. Between you and the deputy president, 
who has brought up this issue of the state? Is it you or is it him? In the response by the Deputy President, on page two of volume six, he did, he did bring out the issue of the estate of his late brother in response to the allegations that he has acquired properties worth 5.2 billion within a period that, within the period that he has been deputy president. So we'll come back to that document much later. I'm only mentioning it now, sir, to clear the hair, whether it is you trying to weep emotions by bringing up this matter, or it is the deputy president attempting, by his own response, to hide behind the shadow of his late brother. I never mentioned any of my deceased relatives. I have them, but I never mentioned any. The deputy president is the one who mentioned his deceased it, relatives. He's actually the one who has brought these materials, isn't it? Indeed. Good. Now we'll come to it. Let's go back to your allegation. Ground number seven, sir. Can you tell the Senate in summary, we are so pressed for time, what is... Mr. Speaker, honorable members, under ground number seven, our allegation is that there are serious reasons to believe that His Excellency Rigathi Gashagwa has committed crimes under section 45 46, 47A3, and 48.1 of the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, as well as sections 2, 3, 4, and 7 of the Proceeds of Crime and the Money Laundering Act. And in short, we, during the short period that I was doing research on this motion, I have come across properties that are registered in the name of the Deputy President or in the name of his children or other proxies that run cumulatively to a value of about 5.2 billion. And there is no clear trace of where the money is to purchase those properties came from. And therefore, under the Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, qualify to be unexplained assets. Number two, I have also listed companies, companies that are associated with the Deputy President, 22 of them. And these companies, you look at the objects and purposes, they are all the same. And it is our theory and our evidence that these companies have been used for money laundering. Similarly, I have also listed companies that have been transacting with the office of the Deputy President, the office held by the Deputy President, His Excellency Rigathi Gashago, with tremendous respect. And they are being paid from that office, and we have laid ground for serious reasons to believe that these companies are actually conduits for corruption, and that political responsibility, even when he's not the accounting officer, rests with the highest holder of that office. And that is the case we are making here. And we shall be showing the connection between the properties and His Excellency 